I'm filming another full day of vintage meals, this time from the 1960s, and I find myself doing a little bit of prep work the night before. I've had my menu planned for weeks, so I wanna go ahead and show you which book I chose to cook from this time. Ta-da! It is McCall's cookbook, the absolutely complete step-by-step -step cooking and serving guide. And if you've been with me for a while, you might remember this book from Christmas of 2021 when I made the no-bake fruitcake. So this is a 1960s cookbook, specifically 1963. I'll be talking a little bit more about the cookbook, the beautiful illustrations and photographs a little bit later, but tonight I am going to be making some country applesauce. You have to cook it and simmer it for a while, so I thought maybe I would prepare it the night before just to save a little bit of time, and then I can warm it up and add the other ingredients tomorrow at lunchtime. So this applesauce, I went too far, it's on page 281. I'm sorry, page 280, it's this one. Look at that cute drawing. And the only ingredients are gonna be apples and sugar. Now, if you're gonna make a big batch of applesauce or apple butter, if you're gonna do anything with apples and you do that a lot, do yourself a favor and get one of these. Well worth it. I will link this in the description down below. I like to make applesauce. Usually I make it in the slow cooker, which gives your house a really wonderful scent. Um, but today we're gonna be making it on the stove top. I am gonna be cutting this recipe in half. So I'm gonna start with one pound of apples. So I have three Granny Smith apples that makes about a pound and a quarter cup of white sugar. I also couldn't forget to show you <laughs> this recipe on the following page for something called melon cha-cha-cha. <laughs> It doesn't get it perfect every time, but it does a decent job. So I'll take the rest of that off with a knife. This is what happens. You take it off, look at that. And it's like sliced too, pretty much. Woo, it's like an apple slinky. So one thing that wasn't listed in the ingredients at the top was some water. So it's just half a cup of water that you bring to a boil of my peeled and cored apples. So I'm just gonna add those to the boiling water, kind of break those up. Give that a stir. Reduce heat and simmer covered for 20 to 25 minutes. That's what it's looking like before we put the cover on. 25 minutes later, and that's what we got. Let's see if it was enough. Yeah, you know what? These are breaking down nicely. In goes the sugar, and I can add more if I want, but I think this is probably gonna be more than enough. So now I just stir this until it's well combined. There's no mention of, of puree or anything like that because this is country applesauce and it's like rustic and, uh, what's a good word? Uh, lumpy, <laughs> not lumpy. Words are failing me. It's 10 p.m. everybody. I'm filming at 10 p.m. What is going on? So I think that's all I'm gonna prep for tonight. Just that applesauce. The other stuff I should be able to make tomorrow, no problem. It has been so much fun to plan these venues. I actually have already planned another full day of meals just because I like planning the menu so much. So I'm gonna clean up the kitchen a little bit so it's all ready for me to go and start cooking in the morning. I'm a breakfast person. I know not everyone is, but if I'm gonna wake up in the morning, I absolutely have to eat something. This particular cookbook has a, an entire chapter on meal planning and menus. And that is where I found my menus for today. So I'm not following any of the breakfast menus exactly. I'm just kind of like loosely basing it on them. So I'm having frozen pineapple chunks as kind of my little fruit side with coffee. For my main dish or the main part of my meal, I'm gonna have egg in a frame. Egg in a frame goes by a lot of different names. Some people call it eggs in a basket. Some people call it egg in the hole. Like there's tons of different names. It's basically a piece of bread that you cook in butter with like an egg in the middle. I love these things and it's something I kind of forget about sometimes. The method that they use in this book is a little bit different than what I do. So I'm, I'm curious to see if this works any better than how I would normally cook it. And you want the butter to go all the way to the edges because you're gonna cook this in the pan. It's gonna get golden and delicious. So next I have to cut a hole in the center of the spread and I'm gonna be using this set of round cutters that I got on Amazon. I first saw these on Old Time Knowledge. Um, I'll go ahead and link this set in the description down below. I mean, look at all those sizes. It's got just about everything you could want. I think that's the one right there. 
So now you have these two pieces like that. Okay, so I'm actually supposed to do the rest of the slice now, or at least start it. So I feel weird about the timing that they give on how to make this because the bread round kind of like, I don't know, I always like to toast that a little bit separately. Now I'm gonna add our egg. And whenever I have to like slip an egg into something, like into a pan, I like to crack it in a little dish. This is already, I know this is gonna stick. I think their method is flawed <laughs> compared to mine. <laughs> so I'm supposed to cover this up and cook it for four minutes. And I, I feel like that is too long, but we'll find out. I stand corrected because this worked and I don't know if it worked better than what I normally do, but it didn't stick like I thought it was going to. What does it look like on the bottom? It's pretty good, it's pretty good. It's very toasty. Got my nice little toasty bread round for dipping. So that is what I'm gonna do. I'm actually gonna break this first. Oh yeah, that's great. That's a nice runny yolk right there. Yeah. Mmm. This is such a good breakfast, you guys. If this is something that you've never eaten or maybe you've forgotten about it, dig it back out, give it another shot. It's delicious. It's like nice buttery toasty bread with a little dippy egg. Mm. I made instant coffee again. Jen, don't laugh at me. My friend Jen knows that we have almost every way of making coffee in this house and I made instant coffee for my 50s video. And I did it again for my 60s video. It's just faster. It seems like it's something they probably would have done at that time too. <laughs> so I'm gonna enjoy my breakfast and I'll see you at lunch. It's still a little bit early for lunch yet, but I'm making soup and it takes about 45 minutes to simmer. So I'm gonna get started on that. And this time I am actually going to be following this menu. So I'm going to be making hamburger soup with some Fiesta coleslaw. I'll have some crackers on the side. And then last night I made that warm country applesauce. The recipe for hamburger soup is on page 553. Oh, I went a little too far there. So this is the recipe for hamburger soup. My mom actually used to make something really close to this a lot when I was growing up and she would put it all in the crock pot and let it simmer all day. This seems pretty close to what my mom made, but I know that this is also a very forgiving recipe and you can kind of like add your own vegetables. But I'm gonna be following the recipe in full, I'm gonna make the full batch and I'm gonna follow the recipe as, as closely as I can. I am gonna substitute one ingredient. You all know how I feel about celery and there is celery in this soup. So I purchased some of these celery flakes. So I still get the flavor without the crunch. And I know, I know, I don't mind cooked celery so much. Raw celery, it's really a texture thing for me, the reason I don't like it. But I also don't wanna have to buy a whole bunch of celery and then figure out how to use it up later. So we're gonna try these celery flakes <laughs> and see how it goes. So this recipe starts with butter. It's a good start to pretty much any recipe if you ask me. Get that melted. So now that the butter is pretty much melted, I'm gonna go ahead and add my ground beef. This is 90-10. This is just kind of what I picked up at the store. And I am just gonna let that brown. I am not gonna drain this. There's not like a ton of fat anyway. And now you just add all of the other ingredients. So that's some carrots that I've thinly sliced. Big old can of diced tomatoes, undrained. A couple of cans of this beef consomme. I have to be careful with this one because the lid Fell to the bottom when I opened it. I don't want to pour it in there. Oh, okay, we're safe. It's it's still stuck in there. Second can goes in. Holy cow, this is a lot of soup. We're gonna see if this freezes beautifully. I think it will. A can of this French onion soup. Mostly shelf stable kind of stuff, except for the beef and the fresh vegetables. Fresh parsley going in. 10 whole peppercorns. Some Italian seasoning. A bay leaf and I'm gonna put in my celery flakes. I, I don't really know exactly how much I wanna add. I'm gonna go for a tablespoon. And then I 
add a couple of cups of water as well. This is a very large <laughs> cooking vessel and I'm filling it up. So I just need to bring that to a boil. It does look pretty with those bright orange carrots as well. It is starting to boil a little bit around the edges. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn down the heat, cover it, let that simmer for 45 minutes. This is lunch today. This seems like a very nice, like hearty kind of vegetable beef soup. This is pretty good. Surprisingly, I think it needs a little bit of salt. The recipe didn't include any salt and I didn't think it would need it just because of the canned soups that went in here, but I'll probably add just a touch of seasoned salt or something to this, but otherwise it's good. So next up I have my coleslaw and I just, don't know what it is about coleslaw lately, but if you saw my Lenten menu that I made, there was also a sour cream coleslaw in that video. So please check that out if you haven't already, but I really liked that one. This one seems like it's pretty good too. I don't make coleslaw that often, but I guess I do now. I'll go ahead and insert some footage so you can see how I made this. So you can kind of see the special ingredients in this one are gonna be like black olives and green peppers. I'm sorry for my olive hating pals, but I love them. Mm -hmm. I really like the flavor that the black olive kind of gives it. The recipe said ripe olives. I had to look up what exactly that meant and it's black olives. I can imagine this would probably be good with green olives too, but it would give it an entirely different flavor. This is pleasant, I enjoy it. It's more of a traditional coleslaw in terms of like the dressing, whereas the one I made for my Lenten menu was like a sour cream dressing. That one was really different. I have my warm country applesauce. It sheeted a little bit and I just like warmed it in the microwave. That's not what they would have done back in the early 60s. This was to be served with a little bit of sour cream and brown sugar on top, which I've never put that on applesauce. It does remind me a little bit of the pineapple and ginger sour cream that I made way, way back when. I mean, this was pretty early on in my channel. Mmm, I like that. That is so good. <laughs> That is so good together. And this like country applesauce, it's, I was trying to find the words last night. I came up with like lumpy and rustic. This is more just like cooked apples basically with a little bit of sugar and water. Applesauce, you think, you know, it's a little bit smoother. Yeah, I really like this combination, not just of the apples and the sour cream, but like the texture of the apples. It really kind of adds a lot. So I will be making this one again for sure. Pretty good lunch, pretty hearty lunch. You know, it may be spring, but it's still chilly outside here. So I think I'm really gonna enjoy this hot soup. I will add a little pinch of salt to it, but I'm very excited for what's to come for dinner. So I wanna make this little dessert for dinner, but I am skeptical after reading through this recipe. The dessert is called fluffy cinnamon tapioca. And I just read through the step-by-step -step instructions. I don't know if I have a great feeling about how this is gonna turn out. It seems so much more complicated than I remember when I was planning this menu. It begins with an egg yolk and sugar, cinnamon, little pinch of salt. Beat this with a rotary beater until combined. I don't have a rotary beater, so let's see if I can do it with a whisk. That's what we're looking at so far. There's no heat on this yet. Stir in the milk, so then we've got the milk, some minute tapioca. 
stir that together and just let that stand for five minutes. That's what it looks like right now. It's thickened slightly. And now I've put some heat under it. So over medium heat, I'm supposed to stir this constantly and bring it to a full boil. So we have a boil. And now I am supposed to remove this from the heat and let it cool for a full 10 minutes. I think that this recipe, it's not so much complicated as it is a little bit fussy with all this starting and stopping. So I've let this cool for a full 10 minutes and it's kind of foamy. And now I'm going to add my vanilla and mix that in. Now I'm going to set this mixture aside and beat an egg white until stiff peaks form. All right, where are we at? Oh, that's pretty good. I don't know if you can see that. Now I fold these egg whites into this mixture. I have a feeling this will be similar to the custard I made for my 1950s video, but that this one is like needlessly complicated. <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe this will be something like really, really special. This is supposed to go into two sherbet dishes. I don't have sherbet dishes. I have little custard cups, so that will have to do. Oh, these might be very full. These will go into the refrigerator for an hour before I get to eat them. All right, I am in the home stretch of this day. It's time to prepare the dinner main dish, which is baked tuna and cheese casserole. You didn't seriously think I was going to make it through this entire day without a casserole, did you? In this bowl, I have some cooked macaroni. To that, I'm adding one can of tuna, and I am cutting this recipe in half. And I have some more black olives. I did not realize what an olive heavy menu I had put together until today. <laughs> I guess I just forgot. Then I have some canned carrots. So these are already cooked and soft and I'm just gonna give that a mix and set it aside. So I've moved us over to the stove so that we can get started on our cheese sauce. And that starts with butter, of course. So I'm gonna melt that. And this cheese sauce is going to be what binds the casserole together. Often you would see something like a cream soup or a white sauce binding a casserole together. And in this case, it's gonna be just like a cheese sauce. And I need to take just a little bit of this melted butter and add it to my seasoned breadcrumbs. And that's, that's just for the topping of the casserole. Now that the butter is mostly melted, I'm adding my onions. I minced these up pretty small because I don't like big crunchy onion pieces. I'm gonna turn the heat off and add some flour and salt and pepper and whisk that together. And whoa, look at that, we're making a roux. Actually, turn that like, so I have this fun whisk that you can do that to and it kind of turns into a roux whisk. If I can find it, I will link it in the description down below, but I do use it quite often because it's nylon coated. It's not metal, so sometimes it works better on certain surfaces. But yeah, you just wanna cook that for a little bit, get rid of that raw flour taste and let it, let it brown just a little. And those lumps are onions, those lumps are not flour. I'm whisking out the lumps of flour. And now I'm going to gradually add milk. And I'm gonna do some whisking while I'm at it. And I might actually go back to that. Put a tiny bit of heat under that. So now I'm supposed to bring this to a boil. Is it boiling? Yes, it is. Boil for one minute and then reduce the heat and add my cheese. So I've got just some medium cheddar cheese. It says sharp in the recipe, but I had medium, so I think it'll be fine. I personally think it maybe needed a little more cheese, but we'll just see, maybe I'm wrong. That is a very thick cheese sauce, holy cow. That is, wow, okay. And now I need to combine my cheese sauce and my macaroni mixture. Let me get a casserole dish. I'm gonna go with this one. This is a one quart casserole dish. So in that goes, spread all of that out. Breadcrumbs that are buttery, those go on top. This is like a nice detail on any casserole, I think, to put some sort of crunchy topping. These get really toasty in the oven, or at least in my experience with other casseroles, that's what happens. This is ready for the oven. 
Okay, I'm almost there. I have one dish left to cook. That is peas with green onions. Growing up, I often had peas with tuna casserole, so I thought this would be an appropriate side dish. Melt some butter in a pan. I'm literally watching butter melt right now. And now I'm adding the remaining ingredients, which is a quarter of a cup of green onions, my frozen peas. You can also use fresh peas. A little bit of salt and black pepper. Give that a stir. There's no water in here. Interesting, interesting. And now I just cover it up and let it cook until it's done. The book says about 10 to 15 minutes. I do not believe them. So we'll see how long it actually takes. Um, I'm too tired to go sit down at the table, as little sense as that makes. I'm just gonna try my dishes right here at the counter. So let's start with the peas, which did not take 15 minutes. Like they were already starting to get a little too toasty after about five. So be careful there with your temperature and time. I like peas. I always have peas in the freezer. I like to eat them with like mac and cheese or just as a veggie side. Really good with the green onions. It gives it a little bit more brightness. And I know the tuna casserole is still really hot, but I kind of want to give it a try now. <laughs> Gotta try to get a little of everything. It's a pretty mild cheese flavor. I probably should have undercooked the macaroni just like a little bit more. I think it needs more salt. Yeah, the seasoning's a little underwhelming on this one. A pretty good basic anyway, just a little bit different than your typical tuna casserole. I personally like tuna casserole. I think it gets kind of a bad rap, but I grew up with it. I think it tastes good, even though it's not time for dessert. I'm gonna try my fluffy cinnamon tapioca. <laughs> Doesn't look like it solidified in that hour that I left it in the fridge. I'm almost tipping it over. Oh, it kind of did. You can see the texture is, is a little bit like thickened. Okay, that's really good. It tastes like horchata kind of. It tastes really delicious. I thought it was gonna be really similar to that baked custard that I made and it's not. It's kind of like a, f I mean, fluffy, <laughs> what it says, fluffy cinnamon tapioca pudding. Mm. It's a little fussy, but I really enjoy it. I better stop eating this. I did it again. I made it through an entire day of 1960s meals. I am gonna enjoy my dinner and maybe give it a day or two and then film some final thoughts and give you some bonus footage of the inside of the book that I used to make all these meals. I've taken some time to reflect and think about which recipes were my favorites, which weren't. Just like in my 1950s video, there wasn't anything in the entire day that I hated, absolutely hated, or wouldn't eat. First, let's talk about this book. This is the McCall's Cookbook from 1963. From my understanding, this book came in a yellow cover like I have. It also came in a red, blue, or green cover. I believe all of those cookbooks are exactly the same. They just had different colored covers. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure there's someone out there who would know. And this is like, one of those kind of catch-all cookbooks. And when I say a catch-all cookbook, what I mean is the type of cookbook that has just about everything. You know, there's a chapter for eggs, there's a chapter for vegetables, fruits, desserts, meats, whatever, you know? These are the types of cookbooks that you may have given as a gift to a newlywed. <laughs> I think I've even had a few people comment that they received this book as a wedding gift from someone at that time. I'll do a quick flip through on this, but if you wanna see something that's more extensive, I will link my No Big Fruit Cake video in the description down below. I did a full video with, with the flip through back around Christmas 2021. The cover is cool. I, I, I just love how they took the O's and they like used plates and pies and whatever. It's got your contents on the back here. I think I pointed this out in my other video too. I love the opening and there's an encyclopedia of herbs basically. It has everything in alphabetical order and what they are, what they're kind of used for. Most of the recipes have some kind of drawing with them and those drawings are in blue, black, and white, at least in this book. Pies and small pastries. And then in addition to those very cute drawings, we do have some full color photographs. So like this one, I think, is this a duck? What are you? This is, it doesn't say. <laughs> 
this one for fruit preserves with all the colorful jars. And it really is just a really great like all round cookbook. Any basic that you could want or need, it's probably in here. A little bit <laughs> on why I choose this type of cookbook when I'm doing these videos, it's just a lot easier for me to, ch to choose this type of book with all kinds of recipes inside. I mean, you saw how many dishes that I cooked for this day of, of 1960s meals. And if I tried to get those from like all different cookbooks, I'd have just a huge stack. So probably for now, when I do this type of video, I'm gonna choose one big cookbook to cook from. What did I like? What didn't I like? My top pick, it's gotta be that fluffy cinnamon tapioca. As big of a fuss as I made about making that recipe and how complicated it was and blah, blah, blah. It was delicious. I had the second one the next day as a dessert. It was amazing. A hundred percent, I would make that again. I think I was just running out of steam for the day and I was like, I can't believe I have to make this dessert where I have to do all of these things. I'm gonna put that recipe in the description down below. Please make it. If you like tapioca pudding, texturally, I understand. It's not always the easiest thing for people to eat. Oh my gosh, it was so good. Second place, the egg in a frame. Probably like once a year, I will go through a stage where I make eggs in a basket or egg in a frame, as it was called in this book, for a little bit for breakfast. It's just like a really solid, delicious thing to have. And you don't have to just eat it for breakfast. You can have it for a quick lunch, a really easy light dinner. It's got everything. <laughs> it is so good. The coleslaw was good. I, I think that the coleslaw I made for my Lenten menu is a little bit better. I don't know why I'm on such a coleslaw kick lately. <laughs> the soup and the casserole were fine. I'm actually still eating that soup. There's so much of it left. I did end up adding a little bit more salt. It was better the next day. Often soups are, especially soups like that, are better the next day. And the casserole, it was okay. I've had better tuna casseroles. I'd probably add a little bit more seasoning and spice to the sauce, but overall it tasted fine. Like I said, nothing that was like really bad, really terrible. But again, I had so much fun doing this. I had so much fun planning it, eating all the recipes, trying them, you know, finding new favorites. I'm gonna make that cinnamon tapioca again. I'm telling you. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. If you happen to have friends and family who love videos like this, please, please share it with them. It does really help my channel get in front of a larger audience. If you'd like to see what else I'm up to, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. Links to both of those are in the description down below. Thanks again for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye.